Hello and welcome all to the 18th session of EXA Conference 2020. My name is Ayelet Baram Sabari. I'm from the Technion and I'll be the chair of this session. I'm really happy to see you all here. We're going to talk today. We'll have four presentations about evaluation in citizen science. And um, each presenter, I'll um, just tell you generally what it's going to be about, who are the presenters, and we'll kick just in. So our first um, presentation by Katya Meyer will address co-evaluation in citizen social science. And um, Katya is a sociologist. Oh, you, you can already see her here. <laughs> so that's how sociologists look like. <laughs> she, since 2018, she's working as a senior postdoc um, at the Department of Science and Technology Studies at the University of Vienna. Katya, please tell us all about uh, co-evaluation in citizen social science. Thank you, Ayelet, for your nice introduction. It's an honor to be here today. I'm stepping in for Barbara Kisslinger, who could unfortunately not be here, but she says hello to everybody. And I hope I do a great job also, uh, like she would have done presenting our project. So today I want to introduce to you our approach to evaluation, which is a, if you like, radical uh, participatory approach. And uh, it's a work in progress. It's a, we are gathering now experimental experiences, if you like. And it's uh, for, for all of us, the three of us, Barbara, Teresa, and me, working at the Center for Social Innovation in Vienna in this Horizon 2020 project called COACT. Um, it, it was just a logical step to go into this direction after all our experiences in the last years with participatory approaches and evaluation. So uh, what I'm going to present you is nothing that is set. Uh, it's a work in progress, as I said, and I hope we can have a discussion afterwards, uh, yeah, like um, going more into details of those things. Co what is co-evaluation? What do we mean by that? Uh, it's a form of participatory evaluation that initiates the conversation on expectations, objectives, and impact already at the start of the project. So either when the research design is co-created with different stakeholders or at last uh, when the participation of actors is negotiated. So uh, you would ask yourself, what is the difference to a normal evaluation? Well, that's exactly here. So the difference between co-evaluation and conventional types of research evaluation is, I mean, there are many differences, but the main difference is that the participants are also involved in the decision on project goals, while well, that is uh, partly citizen science, but they're also involved in the decision on evaluation instruments. Uh, we think, after all our experiences in the last year, that this can create really uh, a, a benefit for the evaluation process itself and an evaluation that matters. So where do we draw our inspiration from? Uh, of course, we uh, are inspired by a very long uh, tradition of participatory evaluation in the development context, but also in gender uh, programming and so on. Uh, but not only there, so we also drew uh, a lot of inspiration from participants, participants of uh, social sciences, like uh, the participatory action uh, research uh, PAR, where the concept of co-researchers uh, was um, uh, yeah, first, uh, let's say, termed uh, in more detail. and. Uh, the, the, the idea of treating your uh, research subjects as co-researchers is to involve them more in positioning them also as, as authorities of their own experiences and expertise, and also in further developing their awareness of systemic issues and move them to social action. So the whole idea he, here is, of course, a, a very strong idea of intervention and social change. And the other inspiration comes from social uh, uh, science and technology studies, SDS. Uh, here I quote uh, as an example, uh, Sheila Jasanov and her concept of co-production because co-production is a very nice uh, theoretical approach to how you can treat knowledge production. And so it's shorthand for the proposition uh, that the ways in which we know and represent a world both nature and society are inseparable from the ways which we choose to live in. I think that is something that is like very deep to our hearts that we learned in our experiences as social researchers. Uh, that yeah, it's always about the world's 
we live in. Um, there are, I, I put this table here. Of course, uh, we can share our slides, so no need to like read all of this uh, <laughs> right in that instant. So there are some, if you like, principles, core principles uh, of co-evaluation that we adapted from um, a more conventional uh, participatory uh, evaluation. And that is that we uh, have a very strong focus on participant ownership, that uh, there is, the openness is really important and we need to find even more ways to open the projects also to the participants, but also to the public in the next step. Um, that uh, it's all about uh, transformation, of course, uh, the uh, identification of lessons learned, the benefits for all the participants. And then it's all about flexibility because uh, the design, of course, when you start at the beginning of a project and co-create the, the, not only the project goals, but also the uh, evaluation instruments, <laughs> the design has to be rather flexible because a lot can happen during a project, which uh, brings me to the next problem of scientific rigor and methodology. So even more important is documentation and transparency of all the methodological steps and all the other things that happen in such a project. And then last but not least, timing. Uh, yeah, well, you evaluation should start as early as possible, but latest during the negotiation of research questions and stakeholder participation. In our project COACT, which I think is present at this conference in several instances, so you might have uh, come across this, the, the, the address of COACT uh, for more information is uh, in the World Wide Web is a coactproject.eu. So if you want to know more, you can look there. But uh, we for the first time, if you like, we try to really systematize our ideas of co-evaluation in a grant scheme, in a grant comparative scheme. And COACT is just perfect for that because it is a project that is addressing social global concerns. Uh, and we have three cases, if you like, one related to mental health care, one to youth employment, and one to environmental justice and gender equality. Uh, and uh, where the citizens are strongly engaged in, as co-researchers. And so we are trying to understand citizen social science here as participatory research methodology co-designed and directly driven by citizen groups sharing a social concern. So here you can see the emphasis is on citizen social science being a set of me methods. And uh, the uh, question here is how can you co-design and co-design it for social change. And so you can then furthermore understand how important it is to create the evaluation of all the kind of methodological sets, but also the steps and all the communication activities already in the beginning together with the citizen groups that have the expertise of their uh, yeah, social concerns. So normally, uh, when, when you do evaluation, I'm, I'm sure here in the group, a lot of people are present who have done a lot of evaluation work. So you know, there's always these key performance indicators. And here in this table, Barbara and Teresa put some of the typical uh, things that you could ask in a citizen science project, uh, like, uh, for example, the level of the scientific dimension. You can ask about new scientific methods, new leading questions for further research, but also new collaboration among societal actors and therefore new knowledge production mechanisms, for example. Yeah? Here, it's maybe also important to note that we are dividing between uh, the focus on process and feasibility and on outcome and impact. We think that's really important to make a distinction here. In the second layer, second dimension, which is the dimension of the citizen scientist, um, him or herself, there is, of course, the question of what can be defined as a personal impact, what is uh, can be defined as knowledge gain or literacy, and uh, what can be recognized. And then uh, what is the expectations on the individual level, and what are new skills and competences acquired? And on a uh, broader dimension of the socio-ecological and economic dimension, you can ask uh, whether the societal goals or social change or objectives can uh, really be tackled in the uh, project. What kinds of social capital have to be raised and like who has what power relation uh, in terms 
of responsibility, but also, of course, in political participation, access to political participation. So all of those are typical or exemplary um, things that you can ask in a participatory research project that, of course, we will also look at. But now the question is, how can we really learn from those case actions that we are developing in the project itself and also not only learn from them in individual ways, but also learn across the cases to build like a more comparative and more abstract or if you like more citizen social science scheme of evaluation and co-evaluation methodology. So uh, across the cases we have built a sort of, sort of an indicator matrix and uh, together with the cases we are establishing something that we call a co-evaluation roadmap uh, in order to facilitate uh, learnings across the cases and you can see here if you can see the slide correctly, so here you can see that we are focusing on output, uh, immediate, intermediate, and long term. So we will talk a lot about outcomes that are far beyond the project end. And there, of course, the problem is how can you evaluate this? So one goal is, of course, to, to build skills in the participants' uh, groups themselves to be able to not only kind of keep on with the intervention or the social change, but also to give them the instruments to evaluate it in the ways that is necessary for them. Then, uh, of course, uh, you can see we have kind of to build a co-evaluation toolbox, which is this kind of uh, here exemplarily uh, illustrated with the data matrix. So we have, of course, mixed methods uh, that is really important to us. Um, we are mixing qualitative and quantitative data, but also direct and indirect data. So we are doing a lot of interviews, focus groups, all these different things that you can do in more participatory uh, settings. But we also have indirect data, like messages shared on the digital platforms or some access statistics and other communication, whatever you can count basically <laughs> on the digital level. And then came COVID. <laughs> and I think all of us experienced that at the moment in big projects that uh, concepts uh, had to, yeah, for uh, undergo a lot of change. Uh, methods had to be changed. And especially our approach of co-evaluation <laughs> was very much building on co-presence. Um, it was building on the idea that uh, we, from, from the Center of Social Innovation, as the kind of uh, moderators of evaluation, could be present in the settings uh, of the different cases, which uh, suddenly uh, was not possible anymore. So right now we are facing a lot of problems in the transition from the co idea of co-presence to the idea of kind of uh, accompanying and, and kind of helping uh, the cases themselves to build the skills and knowledge they need to do the co-evaluation themselves without us being present or just with us being present just at the periphery of the action that is going on uh, actually in the cases themselves. So uh, you could see uh, the, the, the pictures here illustrate uh, what we have gone through. Uh, actually, we are still working with post-its uh, Sometimes I feel that a lot of evaluation instruments are still working with post-its. So, but of course, we, this has a lot of effects and we are still learning from that. And it's not easy, I have to say, so maybe that we can discuss this in a bit. So, uh, yeah, already coming to an end soon. Uh, so, you, as you can imagine, uh, co-evaluation uh, comes with a lot of open questions and, of course, has many limits. So first of all, what we learned, especially now with the transition from co-presence to online activities, uh, of course, we have the GDPR, we have strict data privacy regulations, that is uh, very good. But of course, they also restrict the data exchange between researchers and the co-evaluation team if the team cannot be present. So that is tricky to deal with. Uh, it, would mean that it would mean that we would have to kind of do much, many more informed consent procedures, which again would put too much burden on the other researchers, but also on the participants, and it's confusing. So this is a big problem right now. 
Then we have, of course, uh, language uh, issues, but that is typical for all the projects that work across regions and across languages. So the, evolu the, the, the people responsible for the co-evaluation have, of course, to, to be able to follow the processes and have to be able to, to work in the language that is uh, spoken. Then, of course, uh, we always face the problem of uh, the misconception of evaluation and being evaluated. So, uh, like people think when we come with this term evaluation, which is anyway not the best term to mention to many participant groups, that they are being evaluated for their performance instead of that we are evaluating the project and they are part, of course, of the project, but it's not an assessment uh, like in school of any of their performances. Then we have the, the limit of project dynamics. Of course, there's a lot of uncertainty when you have to be flexible and at the same time trying to maintain research integrity and document everything in a very transparent manner. And then the biggest uh, limit and burden of, of all is that uh, we can overload uh, the, the, the everybody with tasks and responsibilities, especially when we start the evaluation at the beginning of a project. So I'm coming to the end already, and I hope uh, we can discuss uh, very, uh, there is still some time to discuss. I've lost the track on time, but I think we are good in time. Um, we're good, but so, you have many questions. <laughs> I know, I have many questions, and maybe we can take some of them, of course, also through the other presentations that are now to follow. So my question to you, the audience, would be, do you have experience in co-designing evaluation strategies with different stakeholders? And if you have, at which stage? Of the, of the design process. Have you done so already at the beginning of a project, for example? And if you have done so, what were the benefits and the challenges there? And then, of course, we would be super interested in, in kind of uh, getting your insights and your experience on with alternative methods, open evaluation, peer interviews, diaries, storytelling, whatever is possible, especially in times of COVID where everything is moving into the digital world and uh, online so yeah that, those are our questions thanks a lot for your attention uh, looking forward um, to the discussion thank you for an inspiring and interesting and thoughtful presentation we have quite a few questions i'm gonna read them and also read the names of the people who asked them i'm apologizing in advance for mispronouncing anyone's names i'm sorry you can mispronounce mine if you feel if it makes you feel any better so uh, Gary De Hager is asking, uh, first of all, you get a lot of compliments, so I'm not going to read all of them. Uh, uh, the question is, are there different degrees of involvement for co-evaluators in the process? How many involved co-evaluators uh, can such an approach feasibly and meaningfully accommodate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. This is not a question to answer in general. This also is always depending on the cases itself. So, for example, if you work in smaller groups, uh, for example, think about think about projects that that work with youth in small groups. Uh, then, of course, it's it it will maybe with a question think about education, yeah, or or the school system. Then it would make sense to ask at least all. The, the people or the pupils, for example, involved, if they would like to be part of this uh, kind of designing of the evaluation instrument itself. But then think, at the other hand, if you work in a really big project with a lot of different stakeholders, from policymakers to to uh, maybe even industry, think about environmental ju environmental justice cases, right, where you even have sometimes industry uh, proponents involved. There, it doesn't make sense at all to involve everybody in the co-evaluation, but it would make sense to involve at least one uh, like representative of each stakeholder group, or even if they're competing stakeholder groups on one level, to to involve their representation. So it's all about power balance as well. So so evaluation is a very powerful thing, and it it is then the ex post sense making sometimes for policymakers of those research projects. So it's really important to keep in mind to keep this this level of, of balance already during the project. So representation or representativeness i think that is a very important uh, topic here but there is not one answer it depends always on the cases which makes them so hard to compare of course um so thomas karsted is uh, asking do you apply evaluation with regards to science literacy also or would consider this in the future 
Yeah, you know, I mean, for the moment, we are working in a, a citizen social science project, and their science literacy is a very, very difficult topic in itself because the social sciences are often not regarded as, as uh, well, anyway, it's a, they are, yeah, it's, a, it's a big problem. I, I could not go too deep into that. But of course, you can use these approaches, especially for, for science literature, literacy, I think, in schools, because here it's, Sometimes I feel that in some of those like uh, science communication projects in schools, uh, the problem is that uh, those are top-down uh, uh, program schemes that are kind of developed and put over the top of the teachers mm -hmm. and also the pupils. And sometimes it would be really interesting to kind of try to ask uh, from the other side, more bottom-up, to ask the, 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 the young people uh, what they're interested in and what they want to learn and what their goals would be. And the goals might be that they build a robot uh, as compared to understanding the mathematics, you know? That's a big deal. So a, a very uh, a good follow-up question then by uh, Daniel Durler is, uh, what kind of evaluation parameters do citizens choose when you ask them to? Do you already have some insight on that? Maybe even how different groups choose different types of uh, parameters? Yes, definitely. So that's, uh, that's again complicated and it, it also differs very much from immediate to long term, of course, uh, perspectives. But uh, it, it's, I mean, as you, let's, let's stick with the, let's stick with the, 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 the example of the schools, right? So the, the young people, if you, if you want to make them more science literate, they will not have those aims like counting the numbers of, uh, pupils that then started to inscribe themselves in some natural science uh, disciplines at the university. They don't care about those things, right? So for mm -hmm. them, it's important whether they can build this cool robot that they've seen in the YouTube video of this one guy. Yeah. And so, so the, the, the evaluation scheme you can, you can uh, co-develop with the young people here would have all these goals inside as well so that you can show that they have reached the goals that they wanted and they have had learnings which for them made sense. So it's all about sense making to the different stakeholders. And afterwards you can kind of put it together in a, in a basket and create some kind of more policy oriented uh, 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 kind of uh, more uh, diverse uh, perspective for the policymakers to kind of evaluate the program, for example, right? So it's always important to stick to the goals of the people involved and to come and, and kind of collect them together and then, of course, build the right instruments to measure them. And that is actually the bigger problem, the, uh, what, how to measure if those goals were reached or not, because sometimes we are not there anymore when a project ends or sometimes the the end of a project is not uh, the end of financing but somewhere when the when the people really decide what to study for example so so i have another question then yeah. um what happens when you have a conflict for example um in a research uh, in a citizen science project we were in we saw that there was a, a, a tension between those who came it was a monitoring of air, air quality so and there was a tension between those who had uh, you know, like epistemic goals. They just wanted to know. They wanted to find out. They wanted to learn more about the environment. And there were the activists who really wanted data to support their claims. And when the evidence did not support their claims, they said, I don't know, the measurement wasn't good or the machine wasn't good or the project wasn't good or something. So, so apparently they had, the participants had very different goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that is, uh, I'm an STS scholar. So for, more, for me, those things are the most interesting and most exciting uh, moments, you know, in those projects. Because mm -hmm. here we see how expertise is negotiated, but also the authority of knowledge is negotiated. And of course, I think we all stakeholders in such processes have to learn on what, like, the real knowledge and the true knowledge is right and then sometimes it's not so hard to define what the real usable knowledge is and what the true knowledge is because truth is a lot of different things to a lot of different mm -hmm. people so i think and this is i mean that is not really a problem only of evaluation of course but that's a problem of how a, a project how the communication structure of a project is done because exactly at that moment 
the, if the people would sit together, they could learn a lot from each other. They could learn because it that is that is relevant information. When when the when the stakeholders are not happy with the data because it's not supporting their claims, then that is really important. That's an important insight. Of course, you can, will not change the data scientifically. That's not possible. But then there can be a really nice uh, communication. Think about the climate change. The climate change deniers in the U.S. I mean, they built a huge pseudo scientific network that was kind of uh, backing up uh, mm -hmm. the, their ideas. Oh, that, you know? That's a fascinating idea yeah. that you just opened for us, and I think many people would like to discuss it further. But we will just have to move to the next presentation. Thank you so much, Katya. Thank you very much. And our uh, next presentation um, about developing matrices and instruments to evaluate the impacts of citizen science on society, governance, the economy, the environment, and science will be presented to us by Luigi Ciccaroni, who is the vice chair of EXA and uh, innovation lead of Earthwatch. Hello, Luigi. Hi, hi everyone. Let me try to share my screen. Luigi, do you think you can? Uh... Yeah, can you can oh. you hear me? Yeah, we can. But you'll have to yeah. speak closer to the mic. Yes. Um, so I will uh, I will talk to you I will talk to you about Mixer. Uh, Mixer is a project uh, about uh, the impact uh, of citizen science uh, on governance. But uh, if I would have had to write this project now, probably I I would write it uh, on the impact of government uh, on uh, citizen science. I'm the vice chair of EXA, and uh, in this uh, position, I'm also part uh, of the organization of the conference. And uh, I don't like it. It's uh, it's fantastically organized but the format uh, is not the format uh, a conference uh, on citizen science uh, should be. So let me at least, uh, because I'm, I'm not in Trieste, but at least uh, let me stand and walk uh, in my Oxford uh, room. <laughs> Let's say that uh, after just two days uh, of conference, uh, we are already used to this format of uh, everything being online. After uh, five months of uh, uh, this uh, crisis, it looks like uh, the new normal is uh, citizen science uh, carried out online. Again, it shouldn't be that way. I'm leading innovation in Earthwatch, and Earthwatch is all about uh, connecting people to nature. We bring people outside, we teach, uh, we educate uh, in uh, close contact with nature. We, we needed to reinvent everything in this period. And I really hope uh, that uh, we can go back to normal as soon as possible. Or maybe I'm just getting old, I don't know, but uh, I think that preserving uh, a planet uh, to then observing it behind the screen doesn't make sense. Back to MIX. So MIX is, uh, is a big project, uh, is a European project. There are a lot of people involved. Uh, some of them uh, are, are here uh, somewhere. Uh, you can probably, they can say hi in the chat. Uh, we have, uh, well, actually, let me show you these are the partners, uh, apart from Earthlots, and we have uh, uh, Stephen Parky, Parkinson, we have uh, Sasha Woods, we have uh, James Springs, uh, we have Stephen Loisel. They are all here uh, participating. They can help uh, answering questions. We also have uh, Uta Ben. Uta Ben, uh, you have seen her uh, uh, previously in the past days, uh, uh, presenting uh, other uh, connected things. And then uh, other partners all around Europe. So, as I said, uh, this is a, a huge effort with two objectives. So the main one is to measure formally the impact of citizen science. This is something that is needed. This is something that uh, has not been done uh, at uh, this scale so far. 
and I'll be back, of course, uh, on this uh, in a moment. But we also have another another uh, big objective, and this to co-design citizen science activities in a way that they are already ready to be measured with respect to their impact. And to do this, uh, we use uh, a, a technology, a methodology that is already being developed uh, in other projects. So, of course, as in all the projects, we have uh, a, a few case study sites, uh, one in Romania, one in the UK, one in Italy, and one in Hungary. And, uh, well, I'm presenting a project in a conference is, is never a, a very good idea because uh, you could go to the website and you can check uh, what the project is about, as it's not a good idea to present a paper because you can go and read the paper. So let's say that uh, in this presentation, I don't want to really present the project, but I want to show you a few new things that we are working on that are not available. And also I will uh, recommend a few action uh, towards the end. So it's not really explaining what the mixed project is about because uh, there are other ways to do that, but it's uh, understanding why it is important to measure the impact uh, of what we are all doing, of all our activities in citizen science. So we decided to divide the, the panorama of science uh, in, uh, well, science and uh, knowledge in five, uh, as we call domains. So we measure the impact on society, and this means also on the participants, on the communities, impact on the environment. And this is a bias of the project, of course, because the project is about nature-based solutions and the environment. Of course, the project, other projects could be about astronomy, could be about humanities. So let's say that the mixed project is more about uh, uh, the environmental world than other domains. As I said, uh, uh, another important domain is governance. So this is policy making, this is uh, decision making. Of course, the, the impact on science and also the impact uh, on economy. Because uh, when we spend money and we are spending millions in mix, uh, we need to understand if these monies are well spent uh, or if they could have been spent better in another way. So to consider impact, uh, I don't know if you, ever stop to really think about the complexity of measuring impact of anything, not only of citizen science. So we needed to take into account a lot, of, a lot of sources. So first of all, the input of the people working in citizen science as practitioners and uh, as uh, coordinators. A co the coordinator of the project, of, of course, is, is a person that has a lot of knowledge about uh, that project. But also we took into account, uh, we have taken into account the results from uh, a lot of other projects. We have screened uh, 500 projects. Results coming uh, from, uh, a, let's say, activities that are not exactly project or formal project, but are other activities organized by the community. We reviewed other uh, impact assessment framework, both in citizen science and in general. And we are linking all these uh, to the SDGs we are linking this to other uh, measurement framework like uh, MORI. And of course, we are taking into account everything that is coming from the European Commission, like the report that was presented yesterday uh, by, I think, Kim. So quickly, the, the knowledge that we are collecting, that we are organizing, and the impact that we are assessing, of course, is formally organized. and. Uh, as the basis for this, there is an ontology, that they, there is a, a, a conceptual model. So we are developing an ontology, in particular, the part of the ontology that is related to impact. And uh, of course, uh, the platform that we are developing uh, is based on uh, open source technology. I will not go into the details. Uh, all this presentation will be available. It's also available right now. Probably Sasha already shared the link. But let me, let me focus a moment on uh, the interface that you will find when you enter uh, uh, the platform when it will be ready. So the mix platform is made of three main spaces. We have one, the first one is the project space. This is where uh, people can load details about the project. This, this part is very similar to a million other projects. So I will not uh, enter into any details because this is uh, uh, basically the 
entrance page for the project and we need that so we need when people uh, reach the platform they need to be able to enter the platform they need, they need to be able to browse the project but this of course uh, is nothing new the new part is the following so we will have a, a whole part of the platform that is dedicated to uh, information gathering and we want to do this well we want to do this in a way that we capture all the necessary information for uh, understanding the impact of the project, but uh, we are aware that people are not uh, particularly happy of answering for the uh, millionth time uh, all the typical questions about the project. So we are trying to do this uh, in a very gamified way, in a way that uh, not only people uh, will enter information, but they will receive a lot of feedback uh, about uh, uh, what their impact can be. So it will be a learning experience. It's not just uh, uh, the typical answering a survey, but it will be learning how to improve a project through uh, a lot of recommendation and best practices comparison with other projects. And finally, of course, there will be an output. Uh, the platform will provide uh, a very detailed uh, insight uh, assessment of the of the impact of the project. So we will have uh, a characterization of the project. We will have uh, a, a scoring system that uh, analyzes the different domains that I mentioned before: governance, science, environment, uh, um, uh, society, and economy, and. Uh, and then you can uh, dive in into all of these uh, domains to understand why, for example, the impact of this particular project was high or low in science. So how what the density of uh, data, what is the relation between data, participants, geographical scope, uh, and funding, all these kinds of things. And then also a recommendation on uh, how to improve or how to change the impact, the, the impact that uh, a project uh, is having. So finally, what can you do? Well, you can do a couple of things, maybe three things. So uh, if you're really lazy, you can just uh, wait uh, for the second half of next year and check uh, our website, uh, mix.tools. You should be able to find uh, all the but just uh, use them. If you are particularly interested in uh, in the impact of citizen science, then uh, you can uh, actually collaborate in this because we are still building these tools. We are recruiting a, a few beta testers that uh, will be able to shape those tools, uh, uh, taking into account their experience, their point of view, their feelings, so that what will be the output of the project will be in line with, with, with the needs of the people. So we are already, as I said, working with uh, a dozens of coordinators, with a lot of people involved uh, in citizen science project. But uh, if you are interested in uh, uh, shaping these new tools, uh, then uh, uh, there is a, an email there you can uh, or you can reach out to me. But most importantly, think uh, about uh, impact. Uh, at every stage of your project design, at every stage of your project execution, think about uh, what will be the impact on several aspects, several domains. What will be the impact of what we are doing? What will be the impact of collecting data? What will be the impact of uh, uh, engaging that particular sector of society? And uh, what will be uh, finally, let's say the, the change in society, the change in policy of the action that we are taking. So that's, uh, that's the most important thing that we need to take into account uh, to be able to understand that what we did had uh, a, an effect, possibly a positive effect. And that's it. Uh, thank you. You have uh, here a few contact details, our social media, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, you don't need to, to like uh, our uh, uh, post because we don't count uh, uh, likes uh, on social media, but uh, uh, you, you can follow uh, what is going on uh, through them.
Thank you very much. And uh, uh, the presentation and the control is back to the moderator. Hello, Luigi. Thank you so much for this interesting presentation. And we already have a few questions. Um, the first one is, um, I hope I, I pronounced it correctly, uh, Smriti Safaya is asking, were the projects analyzed for impact evaluation matrices global projects, or were they local ones? Well, this is a this is an important aspect. Uh, we we cover both global and local, and also hybrid hybrid projects. There are projects uh, in which uh, you have a global program with uh, a local uh, a sites that are connected. So all this is important because uh, uh, when you talk about impact, uh, what are you talking about? Impact on uh, the whole environment, impact on uh, the society of a particular city, the impact on a community. So this is important to understand because sometimes uh, we just count uh, uh, observations. So it's not the same collecting uh, 30,000 observations all over the world or 30,000 observations in a small city. So all these kinds of things uh, are uh, taken into account uh, in uh, in uh, the platform we are developing. Okay. Um, Dorothy Remenschneider asks, which parameters does uh, MIX use to decide which projects are citizen science and which are not citizen science? Well, this is uh, an interesting question because precisely uh, what we are uh, working on at the moment uh, is uh, uh, that part of the evaluation of the assessment of, uh, of the impact uh, uh, shaped around uh, the characteristic of citizen science. As you know, a few months ago, a, a document uh, has been published by the uh, EXA plus uh, EU citizen science project defining the characteristics that uh, are or should be used to understand uh, if something uh, is citizen science or not. So we are building a part of our impact assessment around those characteristics so that we are sure that uh, when uh, we present uh, uh, the tools, uh, they are absolutely in line with the current thinking about uh, the definition of the citizen science space. Can you tell us more about the operationalization of uh, your impact on society and uh, on uh, economy and so forth. So what kind of parameters uh, will you be looking at, looking at to assess impact? Well, um, apart from, uh, let's say, the, the parameters that are extracted uh, from uh, the characteristic of citizen science, we, of course, use uh, uh, the typical parameters that uh, uh, are often used. So, as I said before, observation collected, people involved, funding used, uh, geographical and temporal scope. But also we are trying to uh, add uh, other parameters, and that's why we are analyzing uh, hundreds of papers to understand exactly what has been used already in the literature and trying to reuse or to adapt whatever can be useful for impact in citizen science. Also, other parameters might be added talking to people. So that's why I mentioned the beta testers. Maybe somebody will come up and say, well, uh, you consider a lot of things, but you didn't consider these things that is very important in my project. So we, we are open to kind of co-creating uh, this uh, uh, set of parameters which is not uh, yet uh, uh, defined. Uh, so it's, uh, we are still open to, to complete it in a way that uh, is uh, as useful as possible. How do you um, uh, address the tension between uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, parameters? I think some of our experience was that things that can be counted were not always representing the, the depth of uh, people's involvement. So will you uh, provide rubrics of different levels of involvement or other ways to assess that? Well, um, hopefully, let's say that sometimes it's difficult to, to measure these things because uh, um, we need to go beyond the typical uh, uh, parameter indicators that uh, are used because uh, 
sometimes we are used that, uh, and the, the European Commission, for example, is absolutely happy that uh, when you present the results of your project, uh, you explain that you had impact because you had uh, X retweet or uh, uh, so many likes uh, in uh, Facebook, or uh, you involved uh, uh, so many people through uh, social media impact. I mean, we need to understand that uh, uh, you can really understand uh, that something is useful and impactful through Facebook likes. I mean, liking on social media is not uh, necessarily translating into uh, the, the project having an impact on these people. So all these nuances, uh, we try to take them into account. So for example, when you mention uh, quality and quantity, well, there is a whole discussion about this, uh, uh, especially in citizen science, because in citizen science, uh, there is a trend, uh, and uh, actually we are writing a paper about this, uh, in which uh, it's important to, to understand that sometimes quantity can be more important than quality. In the uh, Quality defined in the sense of accuracy and quantity defined in the sense of density of, uh, ah, of okay. observations. So sometimes the density of observation can uh, be as much important or more important than the accuracy uh, with which you, mm -hmm. you collect the observation. And uh, there is a lot of science behind it. And we try to take into account also these small things that is not just uh, uh, how accurate something is, or is not just how, how many numbers, how many points you have on the map. You have, you have to uh, relate this uh, to also a, a lot of other parameters. So let's say that mix as, uh, let's say, one of the uh, novelties that is introducing is precisely this uh, relating parameters uh, among them. It's not just uh, providing a list uh, of simple parameters and then the interpretation can be absolutely uh, subjective and personal. Uh, when I was uh, saying um, qualitative, I, I thought about something else. I'm coming from science education and science communication, so I've, I've been thinking about the level of involvement, for example, of the participants. Uh, of course, on one hand, you can have someone who just follow the protocol. On the other hand, you can you have co-designing a project or coming up with your own research questions. And I was wondering if, if that's part of the impact on society that you will be looking at. Um, in this sense, uh, we will reuse the frameworks that have been already uh, presented. So we are not uh, introducing uh, uh, new ways to kind of classify the engagement or the involvement of the people. So. A lot has been written already about the different level of engagement of people in citizen science project. So we will use this uh, kind mm -hmm. of tiers, this classification, and we will take them into account. But we are not redefining the way in which people uh, uh, can be considered, uh, uh, how they can be engaged in a project. So we will, uh, uh, in, uh, in this uh, literature review, of course, we, we took into account uh, also the levels of engagement. And we will use them to add, uh, uh, let's say, details and nuances to, to the impact assessment. But we stick to the existing frameworks. OK. I think uh, everybody in the audience is uh, very much expecting to see your tools and use them. And uh, so again, whoever wants to maybe be part of, uh, of your project, may, should they just uh, contact you? Yeah, they contact. They can contact me or the emails that is in the presentation. So it's easy to reach us. So that, that's not a barrier. So whatever channel you prefer, you can get in touch, and we will uh, work together. Okay, this sounds great, and we're looking forward to hearing what will come out of it next year, maybe. So thank you very yeah. much, Luigi. A pleasure. And our next uh, presentation. Will, be, will concern exploring synergies between citizen science and social sciences and humanities. Um, there's a group of presenters, and uh, I will just uh, introduce you here to Loretta Tugginiena, and she will um, present the other speakers. So Loretta, the stage is yours. Hello to everyone. 
Uh, so we are going uh, for person teams to present uh, our snapshot from a large study that we conducted uh, about the synergies between citizen sciences and social science and humanities with, to which I will refer with abbreviation as SSH. So what we have done, uh, and uh, first of all, that's because it's an interdisciplinary study. So our team is also covers different fields of sciences. So Agli and myself, we are researchers from social sciences. Uh, then Barbara is from humanities and Barbara is from natural sciences. And uh, as I said, this is just a very small snapshot from our large study, so you're free to make pictures, record, or remix, or whatever, share with our presentations. But if you're interested to read the full paper that has been published just before the initial date of the EXA conference, so you're free to go to Pograva Communication Journals and download the paper from there, which is open access. So coming back to the presentation of this snapshot that I promised, uh, there is a brief summary of our methodological approach that we used to, in this study. So first of all, what we aim to is to develop a more integrated understanding of the extent and of ways that SSH are represented and dealt with in citizen science practice. To do so, we used a meta synthesis approach. And as you will see from the figure, we have found out uh, more than 2,700 records that uh, primarily related to that what we look, were looking for. However, in the final sample, we, uh, we used for data analysis for in-depth data analysis, only 62 full text papers. So overall below you see that uh, the majority of papers are in social sciences and uh, a bit less are in natural science and a very few papers that cover humanities and biomedical sciences. Why we look at these quite small figures uh, of the papers, uh, I want to keep you in mind that these papers cover not simply uh, humanities and citizen sciences, but also they are within a kind of natural citizen science within with social sciences and humanities within. So we have for a very super mixed uh, data in these papers. Uh, what we have done so far, so we set five research questions and uh, today we're going to share only findings from two research questions which are about disciplinary fields that uh, encompass uh, uh, or emerge from this citizen science practice and we look at for interdisciplinary synergies within and also we give you um, a snapshot about the purposes why SSH was incorporated in citizen science projects. So I will start with the biomedical sciences, so the findings, what uh, we found out. Definitely we cannot summarize it since uh, there are only two papers. Uh, so um, yes, definitely we could not detect uh, interdisciplinary synergies at high level in these studies and uh, the, you have an example from uh, um, biomedical citizen science that integrated um, uh, the aim to look for social determinants of health, which is mean not only what we usually look for when we want to research about the health, but something that is beyond the field. And to uh, incorporate SSH in biomedical citizen science, they, they have twofold purposes. The one is to need to learn uh, more about different health aspects, so to find a more wider picture to portray widely health as such. And another one, it was to claim a more active role of citizens uh, since uh, they could take decisions uh, in a more active way about their own health. So this is it, what I can say about my medical citizen science uh, that had uh, SSH within. And the next findings goes about natural science. I'd like to invite Baiba to present these findings. Thank you. 
Thank you, Loretta, and also thank you for the rest of the session speakers. Um, yes, so uh, while doing, uh, while we were doing the analysis on citizen science projects under uh, natural science domain, and I hope you can see uh, the continuous presentation, uh, we find out the strong focus on reaching out for sort of outcomes that allows the researcher to understand the better the, the question in hand, so the, the, the research problem. However, we indicate that there is a sort of underrepresentation of social science in this natural science, citizen science project. And um, basically, citizen scientists are mainly approached as data collectors. And uh, we advocate, or sort of also stress that in, in our study, that there is a sort of high potential in involving social science domain, not only to evaluate how the project has been running and uh, discuss the motivations of uh, citizen scientists, but also to understand, for example, the recruiting process more, or how did they got involved and uh, how did they find out that they can get, uh, or how is the possibly, possibility to be involved. And for myself, as coming sort of from environmental sciences, I want to even learn more about these social science tools to actually incorporate them more in citizen science projects. So also for me, it's a lot of learning and uh, I also hope to hear the next um, presenter, Barbara, who is also presenting our results. So please, Barbara. Yes, Barbara is coming in online, so we also will hear about the humanities perspectives. Hello, thank you. I'm briefly talking about the humanities and the findings we had. Concerning the interdisciplinary synergies, we found that the content of the papers rather focused on the analysis or the description of citizen science from the perspective of the humanities but also on combining different disciplines, so natural sciences, social sciences, combined with the humanities. And the domains were basically, in the humanities, were history, general humanities, but also natural sciences and social sciences, and very importantly, also the interlinkage, so the link between natural sciences, social sciences, and the humanities. So why did the projects incorporate uh, social science and the humanities in the citizen science projects? Basically, there were two main findings. First, the added value for the citizens. First, citizens had a very em emotional link with heritage, not only cultural heritage, but also natural heritage. And the studies found that this would be an empowerment or the socialization of heritage. So what was the added value for the researchers? Basically, they had increased coverage when including humanities as well in their project. They also had access to unpublished sources uh, all over the world. So for example, sources found in libraries far, far away. And they also gained access to local knowledge, not only of cultural resources, but also of natural resources in a specific region. And now I'm handing over to Egle. Hello, everybody. So I will briefly present findings from the uh, citizen social sciences. Uh, in our analysis, uh, citizen projects in uh, citizen social sciences were mostly related to interdisciplinary approaches, mixing different disciplines uh, the, from social sciences, such as sociology, psychology, management studies, with different disciplines uh, from uh, other research fields, such as uh, uh, natural sciences, um, humanities, and um, uh, informatics, and especially environmental sciences. Thinking about uh, the purposes, why citizens are uh, involved in these projects. Uh, so we found that the, uh, these projects were mostly demand driven. Uh, that means the questions that uh, were addressed in citizen science projects uh, build, were built in order to solve some social problems and to address societal needs. 
from the methods uh, how citizens were involved in these projects, we found that mostly uh, were, were digital methods and digital ways to involve citizens. And we just found uh, several studies that uh, uh, talked about uh, uh, personal involvement methods, uh, such as uh, gamified experiments or public talks and media advertising. And finally, the role of citizens in the research cycle was mostly uh, related to contributory inputs and uh, uh, focusing on data collection. And uh, we also just found few cases where citizens were involved uh, in the whole research process. So uh, summing up our presentation uh, and uh, making some conclusions what uh, from our work from our project uh, uh, we can say that uh, there is a strong interdisciplinary character of uh, ssh in citizen science projects and uh, uh, actually even uh, we found uh, quite many examples how social citizen science and uh, uh, how uh, social sciences and how humanities uh, are involved in citizen science projects. Uh, nevertheless, SSH are still largely underutilized in citizen science projects. Uh, actually, because uh, one of our uh, predictions was uh, that citizen science um, and um, social citizen science uh, might be uh, uh, in uh, like it's not recognizable and it's not visible enough in uh, the landscape of all other sciences and uh, especially uh, thinking about citizen science projects. So uh, our idea is that uh, citizen science um, will improve uh, to increase sust their sustainability if, for, first of all, SSH frameworks uh, would be applied more proactively to understand uh, the character of society, the character of uh, how um, uh, citizens are involved. And uh, the second point is that methodologies and skills from SSH SSH uh, should be applied to understand the motivation and all learning process of participants uh, to increase their self-efficacy and uh, especially to increase uh, the project outcomes and uh, social impact. So thank you for attention and uh, we hope to address uh, some of your questions. Okay, so thank you very, very much for sharing with us your presentation. We have a few questions now. So Anne is asking, is anyone applying the framework in their engagement design, the IAP2 framework in their engagement design? Also, while you're looking at this question, uh, Katya is uh, asking uh, a methodological question. Were the databases that uh, you chose um, enough to get the diversity of citizen social science approaches? And specifically, how important was it to have the input from the community directly, like in the COST workshop? Who, who of you will want to answer that? Maybe I will take with the second question, since it relates to methodological approach. Uh, so uh, if I understand correctly the question, uh, uh, could we get um, more papers within our sample? This is a question, right? Um, yeah, so how important it was to consult with the, with the community and get a diversity of, uh, of approaches in social science? I mean, that, that's because we relied on the published papers and uh, they are kind of different tradition, what kind of detail is put within. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually face with an issue that uh, not so many papers had uh, such detail as we needed for our study. So maybe that was uh, the most challenging thing when conducting this study. And that's why we drop out from over to 1,700 into 62 papers only. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a, a big, a big uh, that is that to start from. And also I see here a suggestion, maybe to construct a, an annotated bibliography 
for co-act and, and your bibliography together, which might be very, very useful to all the community. So I have another question. Um, Maybe I was wondering. Address oh, the second question because uh, we just answered one about mm -hmm. engagement design. So uh, actually, from what we've read, I do not recall any paper uh, from engage with uh, engagement design. So unfortunately, uh, I do not. Uh, I cannot uh, comment on this because uh, it, at least uh, from the database of what we found and what we analyzed, uh, uh, I do not, do not recall any paper with this approach, this framework. I see. Well, a no, a no answer is also a, an important answer, as we know. So uh, I, have, I have a question for all of you together. Um, can you, did you find characteristics that you can say uh, across citizen science in um, in all the disciplines. These are characteristics that are really relevant to all of them, and these are more disciplinary uh, characteristics. Is there, can, can you um, point to these, or is it very idiosyncratic? I would say it's very dependent. As I just said, it very de depends on the traditions of some fields of sciences, how to describe the study, what detail to put in. But it also depends on the journal requirements, what it allows to put, or whether there is any other restrictions. But uh, uh, I would say that we found a couple of papers that definitely have a wonderful detail that we were looking for. So um, maybe just to have a, a better understanding or, or what we get at the data, you can also find uh, these data sets open on Zenodo repository. So you will see uh, how much detail each paper had. Mm. It's fascinating to see how the norms of publishing actually affect what we <laughs> tell the community. So since you did this amazing meta-analysis, maybe you are the people to ask, what do you think the future um, has for, uh, for, for the different uh, citizen science projects in the different disciplines? Do you think that in the future we'll see more evenly distributed um, use of citizen science methodology uh, in the different disciplines? Maybe I can start with the humanities. So basically, in my personal experience, uh, there are, the citizen science is really gaining ground in the humanities. So it, it started with linguistics, but now also in other fields of science, uh, in other fields of the humanities. So actually for the humanities, we can see that citizen science is really used. What, uh, what concerns uh, citizen science uh, in social sciences, I think uh, uh, the social sciences will be uh, more used in the future because it, it's gaining real attention. Uh, citizen social science as a concept is gaining attention and I think that will be evident from the projects that would, will be developed in the future. Yeah, I think we also saw it in our own session today. In a yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, do you think um, that in extra yeah, the, the natural science? Mm -hmm. Please. Yeah, I just wanted also to push in the natural science because uh, there's lots to learn for us as uh, as coming from this particular domain. As for now, personally, uh, my knowledge is, is 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 limited to surveys and interviews and focus groups. But social science in, in, in sort of this whole discipline provides more tools to explore and to help natural scientists to learn more. So I hope the future is that we work more together with social scientists and humanity people so that we can develop more, sort of integrate all the concepts as well as the previous speakers told. So it's only co-work together with different disciplines. And I think with this beautiful uh, prediction, <laughs> uh, I'll say thank you very much to all the presenters hopefully. and uh, we will see you hopefully in the coffee break soon. Okay, and our last, uh, <laughs> and our last presentation uh, for this session uh, addresses measuring impact in participatory research and open uh, multi-dimensional and multi-actors online evaluation platform.
And uh, the person who will be presenting to us is Anna Chigaroni that uh, joins us from uh, Barcelona and uh, she will tell us all about her co-authors co as well. So thank you very much for joining us, Anna. Thank you, Ailat, and uh, hi to everybody. It's Anna Cigarini um, from Open System, um, a research uh, group at the University of Barcelona and PhD student at the uh, uh, Universitat Oberta de Catalunya. And yeah, it's a long uh, title for a huge effort. I will be presenting you um, uh, another example of an evaluation effort uh, and reflecting and sharing on uh, some of the barriers that uh, and lessons learned that we learned in the development and implementation of this uh, Inspires Open platform, which uh, is a, um, was developed uh, as a collaboration between the uh, Barcelona Institute of Global Health, the Open System Research Group, and the uh, Data Science Research Group from the University of Barcelona, and which is both um, a crowdsourced online repository for uh, participatory projects and uh, an evaluation tool. And the basic idea behind the evaluation strategy is to bring evidence on of the impact that the projects have on the involved actors and on their uh, local context, not only for uh, internal and external assessment, uh, for planning, monitoring or funding, or to answer questions as to who participates, why, where and when, but also as a um, reflective and learning process that pays back participants with information on projects, uh, on process and outcomes at different steps of the research project, which then feeds back to project management. And it does so through open data, real-time uh, feedback and uh, comparable data among projects. So the um, metrics and indicators uh, are the results of a thorough analysis of theoretical discussions of past European projects, the Ferraris, the Mori projects, the open evaluation framework for evaluating citizen science activities developed by Barbara Kieslinger, Katia and her colleagues in Vienna. Um, that attempted to frame a measure impact of research and participatory research projects. It's the result of a, a, a interviews and analysis of state-of-the-art best practices. And these uh, 85 items, resulting items, were then um, integrating, integrated in the platform. The, um, these 85 items are grouped into five main axes and several sub-dimensions or indicators, which are a synthesis, let's say, of the responsible research uh, and innovation and open science principle that define uh, the intended impact of uh, participation, social responsibility and openness in scientific research. And they are more universal in their phrasing, let's say. And these are knowledge democracy, which is intended to evaluate the knowledge produced throughout the process and the extent to which it includes different perspectives and is accessible to the wider community. The citizens-led research axis which is intended to evaluate the role of the community in the research process. The participatory dynamics as axis, which is meant to evaluate the participatory dynamic in itself, the degree, the quality and impact of participation. The integrity dimension that covers the ethical aspects of the projects, inclusion, data management, project design and resources and the transformative change dimension that is intended to evaluate the individual and community level impacts. So the evaluation approach is uh, addressed to all uh, project members, students, uh, community members, project manager and scientists, and is structured along four phases. An initial phase is at the beginning of the project, which couples uh, online questionnaires with a focus group uh, or community meeting uh, that starts the dialogue about um, and initiate the conversation about motivation, uh, expectations and objective. 
uh, of participation and evaluation at mid project, which covers um, overall satisfaction with the ongoing pr uh, project development. Uh, an evaluation at the end of the project, which again couple uh, an online questionnaire and a focus group or community meeting to follow up on the conversation about uh, expectation alignment and perceived impact. And um, ideally an evaluation after six months, the project um, has ended. And here is an example is a, table uh, of the distribution of items across uh, actors and phases. Each actor uh, for each phase is to answer from two to maximum six uh, questions, which are personalized according to the participant's profile and are phrased in the form of a statement, uh, which is to be answered on an eight-point Likert scale, scale, but Space is also given to participants uh, to point out in their own words additional comments if they are willing to do so. A content validity study was performed with nine experts from participatory research projects following Rubio and colleagues to evaluate how representative the items uh, were uh, of the content domain, how, how clear it each item was worded um, to evaluate the overall uh, comprehensiveness of the evaluation uh, tool and to evaluate how relevant is each item, item for its uh, sub-dimensions. So minor revisions were made according to the validation results. And once participants fill in the evaluation forms, um, data are automatically analyzed and returned back through visualizations at uh, three levels. This is the public visualizations that anybody can see, uh, even non-registered uh, users. Uh, and you can see the evaluation of the French uh, project Unoccupied Urban Territories, uh, which reflects the overall uh, uh, evaluation. And it shows how each project and this project specifically is positioned across the five dimensions, which uh, I mentioned to you earlier and which are divided into four gradient according to the um, overall score. Then it's the um, uh, visualization that is accessible to all uh, registered project members, the project uh, overall position, the chart that condensate the, all the evaluation scores for all projects into one indicator and calculates the difference of the evaluation scores between the five axes. The project evolution chart shows that for the current project, the aggregated score for each phase um, and the dispersion of the evaluation scores of uh, the other um, projects registered in the platform. And then there is a bullet chart which shows the score for each of the five axes and uh, each of the its sub dimension. Um, again, this is visible to all registered project members. And then there's one uh, visualization uh, visible only to the project manager, which breaks down the um, evaluation according to the participant profile. So explanations are provided in plain, in plain language as, as for how to read uh, the chart, which and the data anonymized uh, can also be downloaded for all registered users and analyzed independently. There are now 53 projects registered. Um, this is how it looks like. There are information on the projects and also uh, the detail on the evaluation. And I would love to present you with uh, a lot of uh, rich, insightful data. Uh, but yeah, things are not always uh, and probably shouldn't work as expected. So we, we don't yet have preliminary results. Out of the 53 uh, projects registered, only seven uh, projects under, uh, have undergone the evaluation project, process and they are in their first stage. 
Um, but uh, as for the feedbacks that we have received uh, uh, from the participants, if there are some enthusiastic project managers and scientists, um, they would also share with us the um, that yeah the evaluation process. Uh, is also considered a burdensome and separate activity, right? That adds um, to the coordination and uh, extra planning and coordination effort to the day-to-day -day, uh, projects related tasks. These are coupled with uh, a sort of um, skeptical beliefs and negative attitudes towards evaluation, as uh, Katya was mentioning on the part of community members who are not that much comfortable with the concept and word itself of evaluation. Um, so we believe it's important to focus on efforts at considering evaluation as an integrated activity and not uh, separated from other project tasks. It is to be part of the research itself and to be um, a structured dia dialogue with uh, project members since the very beginning of the evaluation process to build trust uh, and mutual understanding as, uh, as for what Katia was commenting before. The feedbacks also showed a certain unease with the platform in itself. Uh, and this is why we are planning for video tutorials for capacity building to, uh, to explain how the platform works. And this is also why a mixed method approach is, is extremely um, valuable in a way that combines um, objective and quantifi quantifiable and comparable uh, measurement with more informal group uh, and community uh, discussions, which on the same uh, the same time also requires for a, a balance between a local context and project specificities, uh, specificities um, or the evaluation of the depth of people involvement compared to the requirements for openness and transferability of results. And uh, last but not least, the need to de develop a culture of evaluation, which is not to be intended as an obligation, which also makes it hard to expose problems or challenges or uh, barriers when they occur, but rather as an harmonized uh, and co-learning process uh, among all actors involved through open, shareable and comparable data that allows to identify commonalities and uh, differences between projects as a reference point for um, overarching cross-project discussion and analysis with a privacy by design approach to data aggregation and anonymization, real-time feedback of the research process and results obtained as a payback to project members, but still with a um, strong focus on collective discussions, uh, learning and critical reflection <clears throat> that is a, <clears throat> a mixed method approach with my a resolve the tension that uh, also Luigi was talking about between the quantity and quality uh, discussions. And this means taking part in discussions groups and providing information as uh, evaluator or project member uh, managers and construct and build this uh, structured dial dialogue between uh, beyond objective and uh, quantifiable measure, measures uh, to develop knowledge and understanding and building this way uh, reflective and uh, evaluation capacity. Thank you very much. This is all I wanted to share with you. If you have any questions or doubts, please put them Thank in you. the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. This was very, very interesting. And I think many people would want to look into what you just suggested. Uh, but first, a few questions. Um, so who gets to decide um, when there are conflicting uh, ideas about, um, about the evaluation? So for example, if, if you have some ideas about how to do that and the project themselves has, 
have other ideas about what is most important to look at? Yeah, um, okay, the, 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 the main idea is that these uh, basically top-down indicators and quantifiable indicators, which are kind of uh, fixed and rigid, are to be coupled with this uh, um, continuous di dialogue which, uh, and more informal group uh, discussion or uh, focus groups, which starts since the very beginning of the evaluation in the first stage, which then allows to go more in depth into uh, and start this uh, discussion and conversation about uh, what are the motivation for participating, what are the um, uh, expected results, what are the objectives, and this on a very uh, micro and project specific level because this information then cannot be really comparable, is to be followed up. Uh, at the end of the project with another focus groups and discussion. And this idea of um, complementing uh, the, um, uh, yeah, this objective measurement of impact and top-down uh, indicators with more uh, community uh, uh, focus groups and discussion is ideally one of the solution to address the tension between, uh, yeah, the need for um, comparative measurement, yeah. uh, but also the depth of information. So on we have just three minutes and two questions. Yeah. So let's do it quick. So one question is from Julia Lorca. Did you build the platform within your project or did you use any existing one? Could it be expanded to other languages, project types and adapted to additional individual project goals? Yeah, if the platform was developed within the Inspire project and it's uh, it's being actually tested now and it surely can be um, adapted and can be included in many different projects. So it's an ongoing uh, uh, effort and it can surely be improved uh, for sure. Oh, sounds good. And uh, Federica uh, Paradiso is asking, is it possible to take part to this uh, in this evaluation process also with an environmental project? And also, is it with a small local project, for example? It, I mean, anybody can uh, can register to the platform. The one who uh, technically, the one who uh, is to create uh, the project is the project manager or, or whoever is in charge, but then he is free uh, to invite and manage this uh, evaluation process uh, with all the um, project members. And it's the project manager or the person in charge who is uh, sending out uh, the invitation to all project members to uh, fill in the questionnaire. So yeah, it's open, totally open. Wonderful. So Anna, I would like to thank you very, very much. And I would like to thank all, also all the other uh, presenters and, and co-authors of the presenters that we had today. I think you will agree with me that we had a splendid group of, um, of uh, papers. And I would like to uh, thank very much the uh, technical support which we enjoy here, which are really uh, professional to the highest degree. So thank you so much, uh, Greta and everybody. And I would like to invite all the audience to the coffee break. And you're going to see the, um, uh, the link to join uh, some of the presenters and other people as well at the coffee break. So please join us there. And we would like to see you, of course, in other sessions as well. Can I please promote number 20? <laughs> I know that it's going to be a great presentation because I'm sharing it as well. And I would really like to see you there as well. So have a great um, break and see you soon. Hey, hey, hey.